Hello and welcome to Beyond the Bottom Line. Today, my partner Paul Roth and I will be interviewing Paul Scarpetta. Paul is a very old friend of ours, having appeared in our classes for many years in the past. Paul is a managing director at Sard Verbinen, which engages in corporate consulting and crisis management, has a long history in the financial area, including a stint with uh, Freddie Mac, where he was a vice president of investor relations. Um, and he's our expert in crisis management, which is a subject we want to talk about today. So let me begin the questioning. Paul, when a case comes to your firm, what's the first time you hear about it? Who's calling you? What's the communication like? Where are they in the process? I would say most often, Larry, uh, a situation comes in after the company has botched its initial response. Uh, and one of its outside advisors, typically its outside counsel, uh, or perhaps a board member will, who knows us uh, from elsewhere will approach us and say the, that we think the company needs your help. And, and is it a problem or is it different when the CEO calls versus when a board member calls or when a third party calls? Uh, the, the nature of the engagement can be different if we are engaged by the board versus the CEO. Right. Um, probably better if the CEO calls us because that would suggest that the CEO understands the, um, the significance of what happened and understands that, that they need to, uh, to address it uh, better than perhaps they have. I wonder whether you have the same experience we have. And that is when this, you first talk to the CEO, the, the question is why are they picking on me uh, everybody does this, or um, what's the big problem? Why are they making a big problem out of this? Denial is, is definitely uh, something we see quite often. Um, and that's the thing you have to break through. In you order have to break through that in order to, in order to move this forward. Uh, because the only way that the company can really get through the crisis is to own up to what happened. And if you're in denial, you're not owning up. I mean, that's what we try and tell people, and that is you've got to get ahead of the crisis, which means you've got to own it and then find out everything about it because you can't talk about it until you know enough about it to talk about it. Because saying, the wrong, saying for things that turn out to be untrue is the worst of all possible worlds. How do you deal with that? Uh, it, it absolutely is. You know, I, I always talk about the early hours and days of a crisis as, uh, as the fog of war. You don't have all the facts, yet all of your stakeholders are reaching out to you and asking you what happened and what you're going to do about it. And there's a real art to responding in that time period. Uh, you don't want to get ahead of your skis. You don't want to speculate. Uh, because if you do it and say something in a, in a sincere effort to, to, uh, to help your stakeholders feel better about the situation, if you say something that ends up not being true simply because you didn't have the information, you've now put your credibility at risk very early on in the crisis, and you're on your back foot, and it's very hard to recover from that. So in your initial statement, you, say, you said that you normally get a call after they've botched the first response. What is that botch like? What have they done normally? So there are a couple of typical ways that companies botch. One is to say nothing. One is this notion that you can stick your head in the sand and, and this will go away. And that simply doesn't work. One of the lessons Paul and I teach in our classroom is that business problems don't age well. <laughs> yeah. That's a, a common uh, error and, and it's, it's a very dangerous one. And one of um, the things that people don't realize today is there's no such thing as a secret. Yeah. You cannot keep a secret. I mean, in, in, the, in the world in which we live, I agree. It's impossible. And it's one of the things that we say to our clients all the time is that the truth is going to get out. Better for you to disclose it yourself. Mm -hmm. Tell your story rather than having someone else tell it for you. You know, one recent example, um, Equifax, when, when that data breach originally happened, the company had no contact with the media. They took all the inquiries and they simply pointed the media to some statements they had put on their website. And they thought that that would be sufficient, and it wasn't. You know, I think a, a, another uh, typical error is one that we just talked about, which is getting ahead of your skis and making statements very early on that prove not to be true. And again, it may not be a deliberate effort uh, attempt to lie. It may simply be that you don't know the facts and you're speculating. That happens very, very often. But let's take a 
issue that's been with us for a long time, Volkswagen. Volkswagen um, failed to acknowledge for a long time. I mean, they had from 2007 to 2015, they were putting these default devices in to prevent the emissions testing from being accurate. And then when it first came out, what was their response? It's a few engineers who were doing something. And now, what's happened since then? I mean, they've gone through a tortured explanation of what's going on. They've paid over $30 billion in fines um, and re for, re returned cars and, and redoing it. And what, there are two people who have pled guilty in the United States and nine more that are uh, under indictment, including the president of the company. Now, how do you avoid something like that happening? Well, the rogue employee uh, explanation is a common one. Uh, many wait, wait, wait. A rogue employee got 11 million defeat <laughs> devices all over the world into Volkswagen and their subsidiary companies? Well, that's why the rogue employee explanation doesn't work. I'm afraid not. Um, but let's, let's think about it this way. Let's look at the context in which this happened. Uh, you have a company here that is a national champion. The auto industry accounts for 20% of Germany's exports, 3% of GDP. This is a company that uh, is closely held by the founding family, the state of Lower Saxony, and one sovereign wealth fund. So it doesn't have the same kind of external shareholder oversight that a more widely held company might have. You have a culture that's command and control. Uh, and you have a, a, a publicly stated goal of overtaking Toyota and becoming the world's largest automaker. Right. That creates enormous pressure on, on the management team to deliver. And then you, uh, you find that the, the, the diesel strategy that you've uh, adopted to crack the U.S. market isn't going to work. What do you do? Well, we saw what Volkswagen did and how well that worked. But I think it's you know, those kinds of pressures weighing on management teams that sometimes brings out the best in people and sometimes causes people to panic. But this was a case where putting these defeat devices in, in the long run, couldn't possibly work. At some point, somebody was going to figure it out. And in, in this case, I think it was one of the universities, University of West Virginia, as I recall. It was, yes did some work on it and discovered that whatever worked in the lab during a, a regulator test didn't work on the road, and they couldn't figure out why. It worked fine when only two of the wheels of the car were engaged, which means the car was in the lab. When all four wheels were engaged, uh, it was a different story. So uh, very, very clever, foolish, but, but clever software coding. Uh, but you're right, Larry, it couldn't work. Not only that, it's intentional disregard of the law and putting people's health in jeopardy. After all, if all this nitrous oxide is ex escaping, you're putting people's health in jeopardy. It was 40 times the permissible limit. So it wasn't close. And it, it wasn't fudging 24, no, 25 it miles it, it per wasn't, gallon. It wasn't close. It wasn't within the realm of error, so to speak. But talk for a moment about how, what goes on in people's minds? I mean, you talked about the dynamic in Germany in the cars, and you, it was a desire to overtake Toyota, and this was not working with the diesel models. But how do you develop a strategy that you're going to put on 11 million cars? And all over the world. And, and, and take the position and, and then, knowing that this is the case, because you know the sales, that the executives go, as you say, point to the rogue employees. How do they, how, what kind of process have they gone through, or have they gone through no process in understanding what the public relations of that is going to be and how that's going to end up for them? Well, I think you know, one of the most important things a company should do but often fails to do in a crisis, is think about it through the lens of your stakeholders. What happens instead is that the CEO looks at the situation, looks at a developing crisis, and says, what's at risk here? My career, my reputation, my future employability, a significant portion of my wealth, 
and I may be facing legal liability. And I think that that's where things go off the rails when the CEO looks at the crisis strictly through those filters and not through the filter of all of the key stakeholders, my customers, my investors, regulators, the general public, the media. They, they look at it through the wrong filter. And do you find when you speak to some of these executives, and you have a long history doing this, that they're so short-termish that they actually think about this in terms of the next year or two or three and not the long-term reputation and the viability of their company? Uh, unfortunately, in many cases, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. And, and do the boards know about this? You know, there's always an issue of where does the board get its information? And generally, the answer to that question is from management. And uh, you and I have talked about that all the time. And the question is, where does the board get its information? Management is the source of the board's information. You only know what management tells you if you're on the board. And, yeah. you know, that's why you see in certain cases where the board will retain its own accounting firm or its own legal to team to investigate exactly what's going on. That's only or, after the problem. Right. Or, right. Or, or in many cases, the, report, the board will retain a firm like us yes. rather than the company retaining us. How about in your firm? When you get uh, an assignment, how secure are you that the management's telling you the truth? Well, we certainly try to do our own due diligence, uh, but there are limits to how much we can do in a crisis situation where we need to decide in a matter of hours whether we're going to engage or not. When you get called upon, when that first call comes in, I assume your instinct is, let's get the assemble the facts and let's get this information out. Do you get a lot of pushback from management saying, we really don't want to talk about this part of the problem or the other part of the problem? Absolutely. Uh, and part of, our, part of our job is to convince them that that's misguided. And what's their logic? How do they explain it? Well, I think their logic is that it may not be understood uh, to which I would respond, well, then it's our job to make it understood. Denial is the number one instinct that seems to take over before you can get people to own the problem. And if they're moving between denial and owning the problem, they want the problem to be as small as possible. One of the things that we do is we help companies prepare for the toughest questions they're going to get. And sometimes they'll ask us to delete certain questions from our list. Great. <laughs> and that's a perfect example of denial. I don't want to deal with that question, so let's not prepare for it. Right. And, when and then the question comes, and they botch it. It must be similar to what goes on before a presidential press conference, where somebody is throwing these questions at the uh, president and saying, you're going to be asked this, you're going to be asked that, you're going to be asked the other thing. It, it's actually very similar to that and uh, it can get pretty uncomfortable at times. Is that a source of controversy between you and the client that gets to be difficult from time to time? It's gotten testy on occasion. I don't know, let me move a little bit off of Volkswagen <coughs> and onto something that I think I consider to be sort of the greatest example of denial taking place, which was back in the uh, after the financial crisis, Standard Chartered Bank was accused of uh, being engaged in $250 uh, billion dollars worth of in transactions with Iran, which it wasn't allowed to do. I just, I just want to add one thing for the purpose of our audience. Standard Chartered is a global bank. It operates all over the world and can't operate and do what it does without being in the United States. It must be in the United States. I'm sorry, Paul. Sure. So it was using its facilities in the United States in order to engage in these kinds of transactions with Iran, and engaging in transactions with Iran was illegal. You remember what, when the, the uh, Department of Financial Services in New York accused it of doing it, the reaction of the CEO of Standard Chartered was? The reaction was a vehement denial of all the allegations, a uh, an admission that there were a few minor administrative errors, I think, on the they order of 300 minor administrative problems, 14 million, 14 in million total, dollars. and that within the context of a bank of our size, that's perfectly reasonable. By the way, that would be perfectly reasonable because we're not all perfect and we have problems. So 300 and 14 million, 
wouldn't be a terrible problem. Absolutely. And, but, then what, and then what happened? Eight days later, uh, DFS and the company announced a settlement in which the company paid $340 million in fines and admitted in full that, in fact, it had uh, conducted... Uh, I have the number 60,000 transactions and $250 billion of improper payments. Yeah, but that was what the amount was that was alleged by the uh, Department of Financial the Services. FS. Eight days after a vehement denial of all of it. What does that do to the credibility of a company? Eight days, you're charged with something, you're told you're not going to be able to do business in the state of New York if you don't remedy this, or if you don't, you know, you're going to lose your license. And you lose your license in New York, you've lost your global bank. And... The CEO says it didn't happen. It's absolutely not true. Not only that, as I recall, they disparaged the superintendent by saying the superintendent was just preparing to run for governor. Mm -hmm. This was a public relations ploy. It had nothing to do with us. Um, he had some choice words about the Americans. Who do these bleep Americans think they are? So we heard a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, what does it do to, to your credibility? If you are a customer, a counterparty, a business partner, are you going to trust a CEO who just did that? And of course, the long-term reputational consequences go on for a, long, for a long period of time. As you point out, in many cases, they have a long tail. These things go on and on and on. Um, Volkswagen's been going on for years. In recent days, they just got hit for another $1.2 billion. There are other suits against them. Other trials will take place or settlements will take place. Um, didn't you talk about uh, Royal Bank of Scotland at yeah, one point? I, I think that's a great example of how long the tail can be on these crises. So Royal Bank of Scotland, which as we know, blew up during the financial crisis, uh, in 2017 reported, reported its first it profitable year in a decade. The, the, the um Bank of England took over ownership of the Royal Bank it, of Scotland. It did, and as a matter of fact, the Bank of England still owns 73% of the company 10 years after the crisis. So that's just one example of how long the tail can be on some of these crises. In 1970, Milton Friedman, I think it was 1970, Milton Friedman wrote a piece which said that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. In the piece, Milton Friedman said, in effect, your business is to increase profits, legally, of course. Don't think about anything else. Don't think about other stakeholders. Don't think about uh, the environment. Don't think about equality. Increase profits, legally. Legally. He said legally. legally. He always said legally. And within the rules of the game or something like that. Do you think this, has, this pressure has caused CEOs to, to really operate right on the fine line of legality? We are seeing somewhat of a shift now in that. And it's, the, the pressure is coming from two directions. Millennials are, are causing the companies they work for to engage in some of, these, uh, some of these social issues in a way they never had before. At the same time that some of the large institutional shareholders like a BlackRock are from the outside uh, telling these companies you can't simply focus on the bottom line. So I think for the first time we are starting to see a shift and it's going to be slow and it's going to be gradual, but it's <coughs> happening. I find it interesting that um, companies that sell products to the public, a Volkswagen for example, would risk their reputation. We, we talked in the classroom about Kobe Steel. Kobe Steel did some nasty things. But nobody ever buys a Kobe Steel something or other. They buy, uh, they might, it might appear in some aircraft engines right. and jet engines and all the rest, but you don't know Kobe Steel. But Volkswagen depends on the retail buyer. And if you put that retail reputation uh, up for question, it seems to me you're diminishing your future. You know, it's been, I'm sure we've all heard it, it's been said many times, it takes years, perhaps decades, to build a reputation and you can lose it in an instant. Yeah, well look, Takata with the airbag <coughs> went bankrupt, right? Yeah. Went out of business. They couldn't recover in terms of 
the damage that they had done by failing to acknowledge that the airbags were faulty and people died. Um, one, one of the other things we talk about, and I'm interested in your opinion on this, is the enablers here. We know that you don't put 11 million defeat devices into Volkswagens because of two people. So there must have been hundreds of people who knew. Where were all those people? You had to notice this program was going in. Did anybody feel a sense of responsibility to say something like, we're putting this company at risk by doing this? One day somebody will find out. If we know and another 100 people know, it's going to get out. There are no secrets among 100 people. I'm sure there were some people who thought that. The question is, do you have the kind of corporate culture that allows or even encourages people to come forward with those, those things? One of the things we know about the corporate culture at Volkswagen was that it was very sort of militaristic command right. and control. And it doesn't sound like the kind of culture where people would be encouraged to do something like that. Corporate culture is a huge issue in, in so many of the crises that, that I've worked on. Um, and in fact, if you don't ultimately address the underlying corporate culture issues that precipitated the crises, you're going to have more in the future. I mean, that's part of the the difficulty with having a CEO admit that the problem has occurred because he wants to control exactly what's said. That, is that your experience? Yes. I mean, because it is ours. And it's, again, it's breaking down that denial, that sense that I can control what's going to be disclosed um, in order to get past the problem. A lot of CEOs have gotten to where they are by getting what they want without any dissent, without any pushback. Do you see many recidivists in your business? You get a problem and three years later there's another problem? Yes, and again, I think the reason that happens is if you don't address the underlying causes and if you just sort of deal with the symptoms, if you have a risk management framework that's not working, you have a corporate culture or a compensation system that has perverse effects on people's behavior, and you don't change those things, you'll see, you'll see, uh, you'll see future crises. Do CEOs often look at these things as outliers? It's just an event that happened, it was accidental. Um, get me past this and I'll be fine. Yes. And, and what kind of advice do you provide to them? Well, I think we, we emphasize what I just said, which is that uh, this, this was not an isolated event. This has, this has some deeper roots. And if you don't want to be hiring us again in a year or two, you need to address those. Even if you can get to a year or two. I mean, as you say, many of these things are reflections of a corporate culture. And if you don't change the corporate culture, if you don't react like you're going to own the issue and you don't really deal with it. I think that's right. And, and by the way, the corporate culture is, is often something that the CEO is very attached to because he or she sees it as a, as a reflection of himself or herself. How much of this do you think is due to the fact that the average tenure of a CEO, I think, is about five years, five years. these days? And the CEO says to himself or herself, I've got to make sure my stock options are worth a lot of money within those five years. I've got to maximize whatever earnings I can have in those five years. And everything is dedicated to those five years. Do you see a lot of that in your practice? Well, I think the whole, the whole notion of short-termism is, is definitely a problem. Um, and I think you know, CEOs are aware that, that their, tenure, their, their tenure is uh, tenuous uh, oftentimes. You know, you now have activists circling any company that shows any sign of weakness. Uh, Is that good? It can be in some cases. Uh, it, can, it can exacerbate the short-termism in other cases. Yeah, I don't think you can generalize as to how that's going to be. I mean, one of the issues is whether a board is recognizing that it needs a long-term plan as well as a short-term plan. I mean, frequently, um, that's what's necessary to articulate what you're doing short-term and what your long-term goals are. 
And sometimes activists have very good ideas about what the long-term goal should be, and sometimes they have very good ideas about what the short-term goal should be. Mm -hmm. But if the corporation is not articulating them and there's no buy-in by the shareholders, that's where you find the activists show up because I, there's no buy-in. I'm always suspicious of boards that pay their board members too much money. And the board members are dependent on the company for their income and therefore lose their credibility with the stockholders they represent. It scares me all the time. Well, it's always an issue. Paul, this has been a great conversation. I really want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us and your experiences. And we hope our audience will join us, Larry and myself, on uh, the next edition of Beyond the Bottom Line. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.